In March of 1994, hundreds of people across western Michigan witnessed a brightly lit sky on what was an otherwise clear night. Calls flooded the police stations with reports of citizens asking about these strange lights overhead that many believed to be unidentified flying objects. Today we're going to discuss one of the most widely witnessed UFO sightings ever, the 1994 Michigan UFO event. This is Red Web. It is another Mystery Monday Task Force. Welcome back to Red Web, the show all about those unsolved mysteries that keep you up at night. And we're just here to help you stay up at night to talk about them. Cryptids, aliens, Mm -hmm. internet mysteries, everything in between. Sometimes some true crime sneaks in. I'm your host and your resident mystery enthusiast, Trevor Collins, joining me, hearing this mystery for the very first time, Alfredo Diaz. Yes, I am. And we're recording this on a Wednesday. Boom. Exposed. Dang, I don't even pe- I don't even think people know that we record on Tuesday, but here we are, <laughs> Wednesday true. afternoon. They have no, they have no idea. All they know is that it releases on Monday. Guess what? We normally record on Tuesdays. Now we're recording this on a Wednesday. Just this week, though, boom, exposed. Boom, exposed. Someone, <laughs> someone was like, "Dang, this has a slightly different vibe to like, it." Oh, hold on, now. this got Wednesday waves this, to this it. Got Wednesday waves. <laughs> yeah, dude. Well, let's ride the Wednesday wave. I'm excited about this one, so I just want to dive in. But we're going to talk about the 1994 sighting. It was the most or one of the most widely reported UFO sightings in history. We're going to talk about the theories behind it. And we talked about this a little bit last week, but I find this episode to be so serendipitously timed. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because of everything going on. Mm -hmm. I don't know, worldwide, if you know about this task force. But of course, we have UAPs, balloons, high atmosphere sort of situations, things getting shot down, one of which in the Michigan area, I believe. But this was submitted by you, Task Force, so thank you so much for uh, sharing this one with us. I want to dive in. The 1994 sighting. Have you ever heard of this? Uh, No, but I was a baby during this time. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Not a well-informed baby. This this baby was not well-read. really nothing to do with it other than I was a baby during this time. Baby not watching the news, I guess. Yeah, I was a three-year-old plump little boy. (laughs) All right. March 8th, 1994. Over 300 residents of western Michigan reported seeing a strange occurrence in the night sky that evening. Witnesses all over the place reported cylindrical lights blinking different colors in the sky. The first sighting occurred around 9 p.m. and they would continue to be spotted for several hours yet to come. This is where things get really, really interesting. We're creating like a little Michigan ecosystem here in the last month or two. But Holly Graves was one of the people that saw these lights from her home in Holland, Michigan around 9.43 p.m. that night. If that sounds like a familiar location, Holland, Michigan is where Stephen Kubaki went to college and uh, is home to many other paranormal stories, but we covered Stephen Kubaki and his odd disappearance really not that long ago. No, not at all. So now you know why we're talking about the Michigan Triangle in that episode, because there's something going on Uh, above Lake Michigan. It all comes back. Um... I'm just thinking of if I was outside my house tonight and I saw Mm -hmm. unexplained lights, I'd probably drive to the city limit. Okay. Just because two things. Do you think they respect jurisdiction or? Well, no, it's just like you ever see any, any type of like the world is ending zombie apocalypse. Got it. I see. The main roads get super clogged up. Absolutely. And I'll be honest. I'm not one to know. Or probably don't have a vehicle capable of just off-road driving like that. Yeah. So I'd be stuck on the main roads. So I'd at least drive out to city limits. Yes. Uh, just I as a precaution. Exactly. Yeah. Just mm-hmm. because at this point, this, this boy, oh boy, does this podcast got my tin foil hat on tight. Oh, yeah. You know what? I've, I've been thinking about a new product. Okay. Stealth tin foil that way you can stay protected huh. in a stylish way. Huh? I'm just pitching this now, Christian, write this down. A hat Clickety lined clacking. with foil. Hmm? That, he, that, I hear the clicks and clacks. Mm-hmm. That's, I'll be honest, eh. ridiculous, but also <laughs> genius. <laughs> All right, we'll put it in the, we'll put it in the old tumbler and see what comes out <laughs> the other side. But I mean, like, but no, I mean, yeah, that's a great idea. Though. Like, like You're one, right. I'll either be like, okay, stuff's hitting the fan. Yep. 
I'm at least able to maneuver, mm-hmm. right? City's locked down real quick. Oh, yeah. Two, if not, I don't know, maybe I just check out a McDonald's that I don't normally go to. Right, you know, I there's a Bucky's just outside of town. Right. That's your excuse. There you go. <laughs> Done. I'm going to go eat somewhere I, haven't, I don't usually eat and then come home. Yeah. So Graves, after seeing this from her home, called 911, of course, as many others did, and described the lights like this, quote, a string of Christmas lights way up in the sky. Graves recalled that she and the officer, the officer actually saw these as well, witnessed the lights constantly moving and resembled one large spotlight in the sky. After the officer left, because I guess there was a home visit after the call, the spotlight then broke up into five different lights and then formed into a circular shape. This is a very common story you're going to hear from many different witnesses corroborating whatever went down up in the sky that night. Her 911 call report matched the sightings of more than 300 other individuals that would call in that night to various Michigan counties. For what it's worth, Michigan has 82 counties. I don't know if that's an international word, so basically subdivisions of a state. Yep. Just so you can break down, you have the, the, the national country, then you have localized states and their governments, then you have counties, and then you have cities and cities, towns yep. within. So 82 counties in Michigan, 42 of which had UFO reports coming in all that night. So That's over a half. Lot. Oh yeah. The reports spanned at least 40 miles in distance, so you know these were either very bright and able to be seen on that clear night or that these lights were getting around and we'll we'll talk a little bit more about where these were popping up in particular because wouldn't you know it, we got some tangible evidence. At oh, least I love that. I don't know if radar is technically tangible, but there were some very strong radar signals happening. So, MUFON or M U F O N, the mutual UFO Network told the free press that they received calls from Ludington, Michigan, all the way to the state border of Indiana, which again, for the international listeners of the task force, that is the southern border of Michigan. Cindy Pravda was another witness located 22 miles or 35 kilometers north in a town called Grand Haven. Pravda said, quote, I watched them for half an hour and that, quote, the one on the far left moved off. It moved to the highway and then came back to the same position. The one to the right was gone in a blink of an eye, and then, eventually, everything disappeared quickly. In an interview with Unsolved Mysteries, Pravda explained that the light was so bright, it seemed like the full moon. And if you've ever seen the full moon on a clear night, it carries some some lumens itself. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, like, I, uh, you know, I have two corgis, and I walk them at night, and when it's a full moon, I don't really need a flashlight. It's wild. Yeah. Yeah how bright that thing can get. I was listening to an old interview of Neil Armstrong and he's describing just how odd the surface of the moon is and the actual color of the rocks when you hold them in your hand versus how bright and white or light gray it looks from the sky. Oh. Because they're actually dark. He was describing them as actually being charcoal looking or some of them were at least. But they were multicolored. Yeah, I mean, we just see it as like a super light gray because the sun's bouncing off. Yeah. Yeah. Just hearing him describe the very odd visual nature of these of the moon rocks is yeah. very interesting. Anyway, I, I digress. So similar to Graves' statement, Pravda saw three to four lights that night, and she claimed that the lights followed each other into different formations. Basically, one would move, then a few seconds later, the rest would then follow. Almost like there was a leading light. It would move kind of randomly, and the rest would follow in some form of formation. And so that's kind of the story of that night, but more information came out kind of in the investigation phase of it all. I just feel like by now, if this was a government thing, why wouldn't the government just be like, yeah, that was us. We were testing some stuff out. Right. It, d- d- don't mind us. Something minor, you know. Also, what controlling the weather. The hell would they be testing out where they would have these multiple lights in different formations? And different colors. Different and, colors. Like, yeah. And honestly, it's all so very theatrical in a way kind of yeah you know or it's like people are over here it's like yeah i I saw it miles and miles away and it was a 30 minute performance yeah (laughs) it's the way they danced and die i'm wondering too like we've been pretty open in talking about aircraft that has once been classified that then got declassified and it's so funny we've talked about that enough that we in the midst of talking about that have seen yet another stealth aircraft be declassified in in the recent year or so and when I think about this, you think of lights in the sky, is that maybe a distraction from tests of secret aircraft? Are those lights for a secret aircraft to use as a point of reference? I don't know exactly what they would be, but 
It makes me wonder if it has anything to do with high altitude stealth aircraft that you definitely wouldn't see even mm -hmm. on a clear night. This is a stretch. Mm. And so that's why I'm saying it's a stretch. I mean, now we have drone light shows. Yeah. At some point that was tested somewhere. Yeah, and that's true. At some point, like, someone was the first to see right. it. And they went, huh? Right. What is it, Dre? And, right. and so, like, who's to say this wasn't just a drone test with lights or I don't know. Or, yeah, or people were testing you know, drones I, to see if that they can make symbols and, right. and, and one eye in the sky for pilots or something. Right. I don't know. Like, like let's control one. For some one. reason, I just keep oh. going back to, like, this is just like a drone demonstration. Yeah. This is, what, 94, right? 94. See, there's going to be a few wrinkles in that, and we're going to get into it. Ooh, we're about yeah, to talk yeah, about yeah, the yeah. investigation. But it. I think that that's interesting. We'll pin it, and we'll come back to it. Yeah. But it does... That's it, my stretch theory. I, I, I kind of like it, though. <laughs> it's, it's based in reality. Okay, so with the extensive influx in calls, Holland police officer Jeff Velthaus reached out to Ottawa County Central Dispatcher to try and find out if there was a radar service in operation nearby that could kind of pin this down, figure out what was going on that night. Ottawa County put him in touch with meteorologist Jack Bouchong, who we're going to talk about a lot. This was around 10 p.m. that he got in contact with Bouchong. In the town of Muskegon, Michigan, Bouchong was working the 4 p.m. midnight shift at the National Weather Service and was the only person in the office when police called. Bouchong took a look at the weather radar and then actually saw, pretty strongly, an object at about 6,000 feet and assumed it was an aircraft. It's about just shy of 2,000 meters. The radar indicated that the object was moving at about 100 miles an hour or 160 kilometers an hour, which is not too unusual for an aircraft. However, the object stopped for about 15 seconds and seemed to hover at that altitude with a zero speed, which is very strange for a plane. And at this point, Bouchong is thinking, maybe this is a blimp or a balloon, but I don't think blimps get I mean, up to a top speed of yeah, that, miles an hour. Yeah, that top speed is, is surprisingly fast. I mean, yeah. a, a, a chopper with jets? like Ooh. Yeah, a really heavily boosted helicopter. Right. It's like, that's the only thing I can think of that would go fast and then be able to stop and hover. Right. And to, and to move that fast and stop that, well, 100 miles an hour is moderate, but right. to stop nearly on a dime and then move quickly. And, and then just to hover, I guess. To that's, hover. Like, that's a big thing. It is. And it would, to me, indicate that the G-forces on a human would be a little extreme. And so it implies that they either have control over that yeah. or that this is an unmanned aircraft. The next interesting thing that happened really kind of throws a wrench into things. Because at this point, after 15 seconds of hovering, stopping in the air, the object rapidly shot up to 12,000 feet, or just over three and a half kilometers. Bouchong saw the single objects. Then, at that point, he's corroborating this all by radar, by the way. I love this. He saw the single object split into three separate objects. What the hell? Yeah. His reports matched other witnesses, as I mentioned, and the one object would move and the rest would follow. So not only did he match the one item became several, but it also matched the one leading object and then the several following. So it's almost like there is a, for lack of a better word, a mothership. Yeah. Kind of coming back to your stretchy theory, maybe this is something being tested out, early drones, early unmanned aircraft that could hover, yeah. testing out how fast they could move up and down, and if you could control one aircraft, but control a whole fleet right. with one... And drones that... hit some high speeds and stop yes. on a dime. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple things yeah, yeah. come to mind. One, do drones show up on radar? Probably not. Um, but I'm, I, I, that's just a guess. I think it depends on the size. Back then, they'd probably be less compact, right? Right. Larger. Mm. And... Two, initial gut check is like, how is this not? Throw it out there. Come on now. How is this not alien? Is what I'm saying. <laughs> how, um, exactly. How is it not alien? How is it not alien? <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but to like counter myself, if they were up there for 30 minutes and it wasn't the government, right? Even if 30 it was. Minutes? Or, well, uh, th th it was a few minutes. hours. Oh, yeah. Okay. So even longer. Like as a total thing, it began around 9 p.m. And we'll get there, but it ended around 2 a.m. Two hours. Two whole Five. hours. Five hours. Five hours. <laughs> oh, you said a couple hours. So it's, it's, it's okay. It's not the math you, podcast. You, two, five, I also said couple. Hours, You're right. About 30 minutes. Um, 
Sorry. Anyway, anyway. If you shave it down, um, okay. So five whole hours. Mm -hmm. Why weren't their jets scrambled? Yeah, interesting you, you question. Know what I mean? Like, if it was a, if it was. Well, do you want to escalate UFO, that quickly? Does or was it? I mean, the thing is, it was a, another government in our airspace. I don't know. I mean, let's look at the recent example. We see this giant balloon, sixty thousand feet in the air over Montana. I don't know how quickly we scrambled, but the thing didn't get popped and shot until South Carolina, I believe. Oh, it took a while. So just going off of that as a recent example, I don't know if that's precedent or not, but I mean, it's a good question. Uh, dude, but I, I also, we had, you know, like a team ready for scrambling. Well, we got a task force here. Team that's of three. True. You, I, me I, in the I, chair. Look, I just, this crossed my mind. Do we not have like a firefighter type situation where the jet pilots are hanging out in a hangar that's where they eat oh, live and breathe yeah and then at any you know on a dime yep they're in the cockpit out they slide the down some pole biceps bursting out of their right. sle their sleeves you they're, know they're, and then uh, they jump go suits and time to boom go. they're in the jet in right. the sky oh i don't know i don't know i'm sure there is always someone somewhere on deck ready to be scrambled yeah now, in the recording from Bouchong's call with Officer Velthaus, Bouchong can be heard noting this, quote, I'm getting it now at about 12,000 feet. It's a pretty strong return. Oh my God, what is this? Now I'm getting three of them, and uh, they're separated by about 5,000 feet in height. So diving into this, you can feel, you can hear the, the almost nervous energy from Bouchong as he's reporting this back to the police. But when he's talking about a return, and a strong return, that refers to an object being detected by radar. Signal goes out, bounces back. The strength of that signal indicates the confidence that it's registering something. A weak signal might indicate like a false positive or something. Maybe not a really fat dove. A, a big old dove, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's moving. Wait, that, it's a bird. It's a bird. It's a bird. It's a bird. <laughs> it's a bird. But yeah, so... The fact that they're getting really strong signals on the radar is, is super compelling to me because we've talked about UFO and UAP stories over many episodes where sometimes there's like really sketchy radar activity, like it's mm -hmm. flipping in and out, uh, or sometimes there's none. So this is one of the few times that not only is it corroborated by hundreds of people, we're getting very strong signals and we're going to get to it, but he actually maps out on his radar across Lake Michigan where he sees these and it, I'm grateful he did because eventually they start to disappear into the night. All right, look, mm -hmm. I don't want the task force to be like, yo, man, Fredo believes in aliens. I'm just saying there, does, there does, must does. be. Yeah, but just, okay, look, mm -hmm. I'm not wild, but how is this not aliens? Okay. I rest my case. Oh, well, I'm not, <laughs> as, as, of, as, as of right as of right now, it's like convince me that it's oddly enough, convince me that it's not aliens. Yeah, we have strong radar evidence. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We're not scrambling jets. I don't. I, I man, I'm at a, I'm I'm baffled right now because like what else will yeah. split like that too? Like I mean, to this day, it it appears that we don't have something that is capable of doing that. Well, I don't know. Maybe this was a, an incredibly small Imperial Star Destroyer and they scrambled two, three TIE fighters <laughs> that were inordinately yeah. big. <laughs> or, <laughs> or it's a jet that shot out two pilots. <laughs> one high, one low. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's very interesting. That's why I'm super excited to have covered this one. I just wanted to dive in, but... At this point now, yeah, there, there's a few objects still hovering very high, 7,000 to 12,000 feet or, you know, between two kilometers and three and a half kilometers. So at this point, Bouchong noticed the aircrafts were stationary over Lake Michigan and were hovering, interestingly enough, over the only part of Lake Michigan that wasn't frozen over. Christian, can you look up how many square miles Lake Michigan is? Just because I'm curious. It is a big lake. and yeah, it's, a, um, it's huge. And just hearing how many square miles or acres or whatever it covers will help kind of solidify the idea of like, okay, why is it hovering specifically over the liquid part? And this always, you know, every time we talk about water and, and UFOs and UAPs, my brain always goes back to this like fading memory mm -hmm. and task force, you got to help me out, where some people theorize that UFOs are actually coming from under the surface, subterranean caverns under the water, that there might be a sub-aquatic 
life form, that there maybe aren't aliens, but whether it's Hollow Earth or lizard people, I don't know. But I find that fascinating, that water and UFOs go together a lot. Are you telling me aliens coming out of the damn crust of the Earth? Yeah, I don't like that. I, it's oddly like that. more likely than like the be incredible more, void that we live in. Like, yeah, you know? I think it'd be more monsters than anything. I just feel like we're going to have like an underwater or, um, uh, I forgot that handy, handy cam movie, Cloverfield. Mm. Just uncover something in the, in the depths of the water. Yeah. What's the size on that lake there? Lake Michigan has a surface area of 22,300 square miles or 57,757 square kilometers. Mm. That's massive. It's like a couple pools, right? Here's the thing, where's Lake Placid? Because that woman raised a big crocodile. <laughs> <laughs> So you're saying you're saying you're saying there's even there's an even bigger alligator in Lake I'm, Michigan. I'm just, I'm just Lake Placid's saying. over in New York, I think. Uh, it, it, is it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah you can see across it. Uh, Lake Placid <laughs> popped into my mind. I don't know why. We're talking about lakes. That's what popped into my head. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to the mind of Alfredo, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, I love it. Lake um, Placid is in New York. Yeah. 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 I think I lived near it for a minute and I, I said, I'm not going over there. Yeah. I <laughs> as seen gorgeous as you want it to be, I'm not going to get nibbled on by a yeah. giant prehistoric alligator mm -hmm. from the Mesozoic era. All right. So coming back to it, giant lake. We have a few aircraft, seven to 12,000 feet, hovering specifically over wherever the lake is thawed. Now, is that a, a coincidence? Are they, is it thawed because that's where they came from? Is it thawed because they're above it? All questions left to be answered. That's just a wild theory that it just made. Yeah, sure. Maybe it popped out of the water. Hmm. Yeah. So they hovered over this part of the lake for two to three hours, and they maintained a triangular formation. In a different interview with Unsolved Mysteries, Bouchong, this time talking with them, stated that dozens of other objects appeared to be, quote, meeting with them, i.e. that while looking at the radar, some objects would move away from this immediate hotspot, this origin site, where the one split into several, some would move away, but three would remain in that triangular formation. Does that make sense? Yeah, like it's dropping off aliens. Or, yeah, or sh shooting them. <gasps> Somebody conjured up Shenron, oh, and then made their wish. The Dragon Balls went up in the air, oh, one, and then went, boing, and then mean, nine, I mean, nine <laughs> lights shot across the planet. <laughs> I mean, honestly, that's a pretty good comparison. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure I just lost 90% of the task force, but hey, Dragon Ball, my uh, childhood. I'm just very baffled right now as to how we don't have a million photos or some type of th five hours. You tell me this thing went on for five hours. Listen, where's the government? We're in the. Where are the conspiracy theorists? Oh, they're out. Where, where are the, the police? They're, they're, they're digging. They're looking. Now, here's the thing. We're in the throes of the 90s. We are in the uncanny valley of quality. We went from film. Film got perfected. Crisp. You can up -res that stuff to 4K, 8K, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then we went into the 90s and we said, we got to go digital. So everything became fuzzy and nasty. And we all lost our childhoods to VCR players. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah. And this happened at 10 p.m. when the sun is far set. I just, I just... And so... You know, there's not a digital camera in the world in the 90s that's going to snap yeah. these photos, right? Oh, yeah. You're, that's you're probably right. why we like, don't. Why we, have a, we have a photo of the, the saggy blimp in the 40s that's crisp as can be. We got nothing from this event outside of the radars, which we'll share on mm, our socials. Yeah, we were in that transition to digital. Um, I don't know. I just don't know how. Like, a ton of police cars and military I'm with you, weren't though. scrambled mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. this seems wild. We've fired on the sky for less. I don't know if we've uh, yeah. covered it or will yeah. cover it. The Battle of Los Angeles, there were sightings in the sky. It's not a super deep yeah. theory, so maybe we'll cover it on our TikTok or something. But, <laughs> but like, yeah, they thought they saw UFOs in the sky and they started firing, actually firing upon them. Right. So I, I'm with you, man. I feel like with this amount of people, 300 people, one of the biggest reported things, like, why aren't we scrambling, moving, shining know. lights? I don't know. So... The reason I wanted to kind of shoehorn in the mentions of the balloons that have been going on, I mean, it's hard to ignore because it's, it's happening so in our faces right now as of the recording of this episode, but also because the three objects that we were talking about here recently on the radar started to fluctuate in altitude. At this point, they're coming down as low as 4,000 feet all the way up as high as 55,000 feet, which is... Oh, never mind. You can't shoot that. Can't shoot that. But it's also very, very close to the high altitude balloons that we're seeing. And just for what it's worth, average 
airliners fly around the 30,000 mark. So this is really high up in the sky. Yeah, it's up there. Um, what if that is um, maybe the balloons we see today are them returning? Oh, they're back. We I want to see them at night. Got any lights on them? Yeah. I don't think they do, actually. I think... Yeah, so we've shot them down, right? We, I think we've taken down three or four at this point. And so, I mean, like, are we not dissecting them like frogs? We are. Biology class? Yeah, we definitely are. And again, we're totally dating the podcast, and we're going to be out of out of date by the time, Task Force, you hear this episode. But oh, yeah, yeah, as of the recording of this episode, they're definitely looking into it. I'm sure they're keeping it very top secret. But mm -hmm. I listened to the senators today. There's a bunch of talking heads, and they're, they're like, yes, there's a propulsion system on this one. This one was the size of a school bus with a giant balloon, and these ones school were bus. yeah, and then these ones over here were smaller, maybe the size of an ATV. So yeah, they're they're still getting in there to figure it all out. Wow. Yeah, Bouchong recounts that at one point one of the objects moved 20 miles or 32 kilometers out over Lake Michigan in less than one second. 20 miles in less than a second, indicating that they must have been moving a speed of 72,000 miles per hour, or 115 thousand kilometers per hour do we have what does a fighter jet get up to no not that fast. not that not that actually no never mind 20 that's, miles in a sec 20 miles per second that's that's starting to feel like fast. a satellite buzzing the low atmosphere not even a cheetah with skates and boosters can do that mm -mm. chester you're out <laughs> it ain't easy being cheesy it ain't easy going 20 miles in a second that i don't even like i don't even can how fast does a spaceship go like could a human survive that yes it depends on your acceleration the acceleration right. will kill you oh. but the speed oh. won't so it all depends on how fast you accept okay so if it went from static to 20 miles over to the left in one second that is nigh infinite as far as uh g-forces are concerned oh That's yeah i mean it, you might as well just not you worry just calculating it. you yeah you would instantly become mush on the back of the wall you know so that's what to me says, right? This is where I pull out my dusty old aerospace engineering degree. I say the acceleration is tremendous. It's either completely undemanned and super lightweight and very cutting edge, or it's a craft that we have no idea about and it's able to shield the pilot or the control systems mm. from that. Because even control systems would not be able to really properly handle that level of push and pull. And so you'd almost oh, have to yeah, wonder too. is you have to think about the actual mechanics mm -hmm. surviving as well. Yeah. And so this is where you start to enter deep classified territory. You know, you listen to Bob Lazar, individuals like that that have stories or you think about aliens and you go, is this a bleeding edge piece of technology, top secret that is moving space-time around it so the object isn't actually moving, but rather it's pushing and pulling the space around it to move it through the air. Oh, that so is... So you actually aren't moving, right. you're moving the air around yeah, you to yeah. translocate yourself. To super simplify it. Very interesting. Mind-boggling. It really is. That or one object disappeared, turned off, crashed, went stealth, and another one appeared. And, oh, I didn't it, think about that. And it's yeah. two objects, yeah. right? But again, convince me how this is an alien. I'm very, very excited to see what the theories are. Yeah. And how it starts breaking things down. Because right now, these are things that aren't possible. We have the tangible evidence that is the radar. Oh, yeah. Although we are banking on this person and the radar and their narrative. That, you know what? You're kind of, you're kind of right. Because to reiterate, Bouchong was the only person at the National Weather Service station when they called. Yeah. I do believe that police spoke with him and arrived there, but it's a great point. I mean, you got to uncover every stone. So I'm going to show you the two radars that we have here, and you can kind of see how some of these dots have moved. But before we get there, just a few other pieces of information to finish out kind of the investigation. But one by one, at this point, the objects began disappearing from the radars until finally the last of the objects vanished around 2 a.m. Before they disappeared entirely, however, Bouchong traced the spots on the radar in order to keep track of what he saw that night and where they were. So here is the later radar and here's the initial radar to kind of show you how some of the things have moved and how some are static as always task force we have some visual assets you're going to see those in our video version of the podcast as well as on our social media if you want to check us out at red web pod but yeah just a little sonar a little yeah, radar of really uh, cool. Lake michigan uh, yeah there are reads that they are static but uh lined up 
vertically different elevations mm -hmm. and then how they kind of split off two staying towards the bottom right one going a little bit up to the left i just man if i was just that you know my my job is just radar weather station type stuff and i and i saw all that happening i'd be i'd be very taken back yeah you you went to work one day to go cool when's the storm coming and then suddenly you're chasing unknown unidentifiable objects with strong radar pings yeah. throughout the night and that that kind of takes me to like the uh the movie armageddon right because there are people on telescopes we have some very high i don't know what the proper word is but um some telescopes that could reach pretty far high magnification yeah i, I guess so yeah high optic um, mm -hmm. telescopes but like I mean, just the beginning, of, like like I said, the movie are again, like to just say one person doesn't spot something like a giant asteroid and just yeah. go, oh my goodness, like this is, this is coming. Because that's Don't realistic. I mean, it is. Like we get hit by um, like meteors all the time. Mm -hmm. And so to say not one big boy just comes rolling our way. Like, what do we do? Oh, yeah. Uh, like, do we have a plan? Well, that's totally different kind of conversation for another day but kind of we're tracking thousands of objects in our immediate solar system huh. trying to make sure and it's we identify we new tracking. ones all the time we've landed on meteors we've pushed meteors so we've kind of dabbled with it but it's it's very expensive yeah and i mean look expensive as it is if there was oh, a right if there was a but to test it was, yeah if there was a world killer i'm sure that all of the government will come together all the countries and be like look it's it's either this thing takes us out. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, or we come together. That's when you go, money doesn't, money's not right, real. Right. Stop that we thing. We don't like each other. Ignore money. Let's <laughs> set that aside. Let's ignore money. Yeah. Get our smartest people mm -hmm. from our country, your country. We need people up there. Yeah. Like taking care of this thing. I recently read a book. I finished it the other week by Andy Weir, the same guy who wrote The Martian. It's called Project Hail Mary. Phenomenal book. Very easy read if you want. But it kind of approaches that very question. What happens if there's a world-ending event that we are just not equipped for? How do we approach it? How do we figure it out? And and it kind of talks your way through the government body that then takes over. Like there's there was one woman in charge of this entire new thing, and she had precedence over everything. Every government every faculty of the world wow like the like the president of the world yeah just had <laughs> full authority over everything to make anything happen and he, and you kind of need it but i, I do feel like Great you know book. bringing it back to the topic of aliens if and there were aliens in the book oh god it was so if, cool if there were aliens uh -huh. that wanted to wipe the human race i genuinely believe there's something we could do about it you wouldn't see it coming we, we wouldn't see it coming they would uh, emp us to hell uh, like you know what I mean cut off like routes uh shipping lines all that kind of stuff like nothing would touch this guy like they'd send or they'd leave us alone and we do it ourselves right not no, to no, be no, so pessimistic right but. no completely but I just I just feel like if if a species has the ability to travel across like you know the universe and all that kind of stuff they mm -hmm. wanted to just they're there's yeah at that at that point they're so far advanced and yeah. like oh they have oh cool they have electronics and touch screens like we just we just drop this into the sky and there goes all of it. Yeah. We're talking type one, type two species, you know, it's a whole different thing, but basically I think it's type one can harness the entire power of a planet, type two harness the entire power of a solar system, like the sun, et cetera, et cetera. Might be getting that wrong. Either way, they can do that and they come oh, yeah. inching across us like type, <laughs> type point three right. species or whatever. Yeah. Done. It's done. It's like a peaceful death in the night, you know, it, yeah, it, it's done though. All right, coming back to Bouchong. So at this point, Bouchong said he called the FAA to ask if they had seen anything else themselves that night on radar. Bouchong claims when talking to them that he saw three aircraft that didn't have transponder codes. Transponder codes are four-digit codes that help air traffic controllers identify specific aircraft. And the three aircraft he claims they saw corresponded on radar to the location of the three lights that countless witnesses were reporting. Basically, He's saying that there were three unidentified aircraft that lined up pretty nicely with these lights. The story quickly gained national attention at this point, and even more witnesses came forward, as we've seen with many stories. Once it goes yeah. public, it really goes public. However, no concrete evidence was ever provided, and no explanation for these sightings was ever found. 
We're going to talk a little bit more about witnesses' stories in the theories. But before we get that, I do want to give just a small anecdote from the director of the National Weather Service. Because it was kind of a theory, but it really isn't. And you'll see why. So okay. a year after the event, the Chicago Tribune, which is a very nearby city, by the way, interviewed Leo Grenier, the director of the National Weather Service in Muskegon. Grenier stated he does not believe it was any sort of UFO whatsoever and says, quote, there's a strong earthly explanation for what occurred. However, he never elaborated on what that explanation might be. And he told local reporters that he had a pretty good idea. In his words, quote, pretty good idea. He refused to speak on it any further and said a few times at that point that he might tell people once he retires from the National Weather Service. Unfortunately, Grenier passed away in 2005, and it appears that he did not ever share his theory publicly, and so we will never know what his pretty good idea of what went down that night must have been. A pretty good idea. The tell us. Right. Let us know. Put it on a piece of paper. So, uh, you know, like, with a I dead just, man switch kind I, of thing. I, I don't know. Because if it's something that's like, okay, I have a pretty good idea. And you know what? I'll tell you guys eventually. To me, that tells me it's not government secret stuff. Mm. It's not like someone else invading or aliens. Well, maybe it is because he or, wanted to protect or, his job. I'll, I'll wait until retirement and then I'll say it, right? <sighs> what, like, what does that tell you in your gut check? I mean, my gut check tells me that it's something that's lighter. Oh, really? Yeah. It's like, I'll tell you, uh, you know, I'll maybe tell you later hmm but I, I don't know you think I, if it was like a government like was, secret he'd be disappeared kind of uh, more so just like don't say anything yeah you know yeah instead of being out here like oh i'm kind of teasing it maybe yeah, okay i can see and, that and the whole thing being it's like there's a really good there's a there's i have a pretty good idea what this is yeah i think that kind of like throws you off right it just seems so like all right this is, it really does Pretty yeah, laid I think back. I know what this is. Yeah, I think I know what this is. And I'm like, they might tell you guys when I retire. Not anything like top secret or or, or scary or mm -hmm. over the you know what I mean? Like over the top or anything like that. Or or just like people are knocking at that is a door. But that's just my gut check on yeah. that. Yeah. Right. Because it just it, it it lines up oddly for me. Yeah. All right. Well, that was kind of a theory, but I wanted to kind of uh, so shallow it's a non-answer right but i wanted to pull that yeah they passed away because i was like well where are they now they're mm -hmm. probably in their retirement but of mm -hmm. course they passed away mm -hmm. and we know nothing we know nothing that's what i'm saying like cue up as it's called a dead man switch so that way you can kind of withhold the th it's basically like an email right if i wanted to have an email go off so that way if i stopped doing a certain action on my computer the email would fire off mm -hmm. i.e a dead man switch so that way if something happens to me dead, absent, or otherwise abducted, the email goes out. Put all that information in an email, okay? Put all that information in a, in a carrier pigeon, bury it in a time capsule. Right. I just, come on. What's up, Task Force? This is the gap in the mystery that I get to talk directly to you about the uh, Task Force goings on and what's happening here in the headquarters. We have a lot to talk about, so I'm just gonna punch your eardrums with it. This Thursday, March 9th, 2023, we are pre-selling the Sippy Cup of Knowledge. We're going to do a whole live stream for like an hour. So if you buy during that window, we're going to put some spooky facts and some Fredo knowledge into those cups. We're going to try to sign as many of those little knowledge cards as possible. So that way you get a cup filled with knowledge. You don't have to worry about putting your own knowledge into it. We're going to distill it down, pump it into that little sippy cup, and it will be yours for the long haul. We also have an RTX event coming up this summer. Go to rtxevent.com if you want to get all the juicy details. I'm going to go ahead and tease this out before it's even official. That's right. Someone's going to come for me if they, <laughs> if I'm a liar. But there's actually a lot going on with Red Web. We're going to have the annual meeting of the minds. It's going to be a panel. We're trying to get something really cool on the show floor, something that you can get tangible hands on with something experiential, maybe something to do with case files. I don't know, but you get to see Fredo and I, we're going to try to see as many people as possible, sign things, take selfies, do whatever you do at conventions. And we also will have a themed escape room right across the street from the convention center. There's a lot going on and a lot that we want to update you on as things develop, but that's what we 
we have right now. If you're interested in that, come see us at RTX this summer, rtxevent.com to get more information. It's the 20th year for Rooster Teeth. And so this is going to be a huge one. Please come out. Would love to see all of you lovely task force members like we have in years past. I mean, last year, somebody even brought a truck themed around the task force. You guys are amazing. Anyway, look forward to seeing you all there. And we're going to talk a little bit more as July approaches. You're going to hear us talk more about that with more details. But anyway, yeah, rtxevent.com. With that said, here are a couple fantastic sponsors. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by BetterHelp. Getting to know yourself can be a lifelong process, especially because we're always growing and changing. Therapy is all about deepening your personal self-awareness and your own understanding of yourself. Talking things through with a professional can help us understand why we react the way we do or even just figure out what we want. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are in your life right now. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It offers so many benefits and it's super convenient to use. It's entirely online and designed to be flexible and suited to your personal schedule. So discover your potential with BetterHelp by visiting betterhelp.com slash redweb today to get 10% off your first month. Once again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash redweb. Learn more about yourself. You are your best ally, so why not explore yourself? Better help. This episode of Red Web is also sponsored by Babbel. One of the most exciting things about the new year is all the sense of possibility that you have no idea what adventures are in store for you, like traveling or perhaps starting a new job. And there's no better way to prepare for 2023 than by learning a new language with Babbel. With Babbel, you only need 10 minutes to complete a lesson so you can start having real life conversations in a new language in as little as three weeks. You can change from 14 different languages, plus their speech recognition technology helps you improve your pronunciation and your accent. If you want to sound a little bit more natural, it's a little bit of the immersion from home. Babbel lessons were created by over 150 language experts and their teaching method has been scientifically proven to be effective. If you know me, you know I like to work on my pronunciation. I, I try, I, I flub a lot. Listen, there's a lot of cities in this world and I try my best to give the proper pronunciation, but you also know that I have dabbled with Spanish and French in the past and apps like Babbel are fantastic. I really enjoy using Babbel because it is so intuitive and it makes relearning and refreshing some of those languages like Spanish or French, it makes it easy and it makes it fun and it kind of gamifies it a little bit. And if that sounds interesting to you right now, you can get up to 55% off your subscription by going to babbel.com slash red web. Once again, that's babbel.com slash red web to get up to 55% off your subscription. Babbel language for life. This episode of Red Web is also sponsored by HelloFresh. Food inflation has been wild the last year or so. I mean, look at eggs, but we've all got tighter food budgets. That's the fact. That's why it's the perfect time to consider HelloFresh. It's cheaper than grocery shopping and 25 less expensive than takeout. HelloFresh sends you excellent recipes with pre-proportioned ingredients right to your door. So on top of saving money, you also save yourself a trip to the grocery store. And with HelloFresh, you can still have flexibility. They let you customize, select meals, and swap out proteins or sides, and even add protein to a veggie dish if you so choose. You can even upgrade for organic chicken or organic ground beef on select meals, and everything is oh so mm, fresh. You know I've talked about HelloFresh many times in the past, and I really do enjoy it. You know how much I hate the grocery store, but I love those fresh, fresh, good, good meals. In fact, I haven't had a single meal from HelloFresh that I didn't like. Last night in particular, I made their hoisin glazed pork tenderloin recipe. It was so good. It's not very often that I make pork, but it was really awesome to get familiar with their recipes because they got the pictures. It's very simplified, and you can keep those recipes for the long haul if you so choose, but it's a really good service, and I like that it all comes to my door. It's very fresh. You know it's straight from the farm and everything like that. I love it. Go to HelloFresh.com slash RedWeb60 and use code RedWeb60 for 60% off plus free shipping. That's some good stuff right there. Again, 60% off plus free shipping at HelloFresh.com slash RedWeb60 using code RedWeb60. Get your grub on and HelloFresh. With that said, let's get right back into the mystery. All right, let's talk about some of the theories going on in this sighting, this wild night of sightings. 
So before we dive into any specific theory, we're going to do something unique. We're going to talk about all the obvious answers. According to the Chicago Tribune, researchers have ruled out small planes, helicopters, as you mentioned, military aircrafts, advertising blimps, weather balloons, marsh gas, satellites, falling stars, and space debris. The meteorologist Jack Bouchong determined that the object he was viewing on the radar weren't rain or any other storm cell or any other weather-based phenomenon. He described the object as smooth and reflective, which was determined by the amount of energy coming back on the echo once again, talking about that strong signal return. Yeah. Bouchong was also able to rule out swamp gas, stating that swamp gas cannot be detected by radar, nor was it any sort of super refraction of the radar beam as the movements proved otherwise, nor is it possible at the level that Bouchong had raised the radar antenna to. So with that said, let's move into the first theory, ground clutter and storm cells. So funny to go from Bouchong yeah. saying, not a storm cell, but we're going to go deep on it. That, I like that, that. Honestly, one thing I didn't think about was advertisement. It could have been yeah. like a viral thing, right? Ooh. Where it's like, there's just weird lights in the air and whatnot. And all of a sudden it's like, buy Pogs. Yeah, you shine a light <laughs> on it and it goes, drink your Ovaltine. You're like, ah! Oh, uh, oh. uh, but see, yeah, it's got to be something in the 90s. Like, Pog was a thing. I never got into Pog. Okay, so the first theory we're going to talk about, counter to what Bouchong was saying, because there's more to talk about here, ground clutter and storm cells. Not wanting to have any affiliation with UFOs, shortly after the incident, the National Weather Service stated that the returns on the radar could, could have been by a temperature inversion. This is not the first time we've talked about this being at play. It's a rare phenomenon, but it is entirely possible that it might have happened. A layer of warm air, basically a few thousand feet above the Earth's surface, inverting, interacting with cold air and other meteorological events. Mm -hmm. I'm gesturing wildly because yeah. I'm... I, Listen, this ain't my bag. Ooh, science. Here's the thing. Mm -hmm. That explains radar. Does not explain the sighting that people see. The lights and the yeah, moving the and the following. And the, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's explain that. And, you know, unless you got something else for me on that. Yeah. So we'll continue on here and we'll see what we what we got. So the phenomenon is called ground clutter. However, as I mentioned, Bouchong has since stated as kind of being part of the National Weather Service. He's personally stated that because of the incredible heights that the objects reached, ground clutter must not have been possible. It's not a possibility. There were also suspicions that the objects on the radar could have been storm cells or some other type of weather phenomenon. However, in the call with Officer Velthaus, Bouchong stated, quote, I have never seen anything like this, not even when I'm doing storms. These aren't storms. Bouchong also went through intense radar training whilst working at the National Weather Service. So all in all, it is a possibility to answer I don't know. It's even flimsy on the radar side. But to your point, it doesn't answer the, the audience sightings. followings one another. Exactly. That's that's the thing. Tons of people in different areas, miles away, don't know each other. Right. But this five-hour light show mm -hmm. doesn't explain that. The only thing weather-based, and I still don't properly understand it because it is so misunderstood, uh, because it's so rare, is ball lightning. So it's so rare to the point that I don't, I don't know if we know it exists. Christian, I don't know if there's anything we can find on that, but, and, and forgive me for my layman's terms here, but ball lightning essentially being the idea that lightning, for whatever reason, for whatever purpose or causality is, is like just a sphere of lightning, a super bright flash in a sphere shaped. What do we hear the thunder though? It's a great point. And this is going on for five hours, but I don't know if it flashes and blows up or creates that sonic boom that, that thunder or that yeah. lightning does. I don't know. Again, this is this is totally estranged territory for me, but I have heard it talked about a good amount. It's just not well known. Mm. Are you asking if ball lightning was seen during this or I guess if ball like, lightning is seen in general? Well, I'm, yeah, I'm I guess I'm just asking question. like, do we know for a fact that ball lightning exists, whether mm -hmm. we understand it or not? Like, yeah. is it a confirmed phenomenon and yes. we just don't understand it yet? Okay. Yeah. It is a confirmed phenomenon. Okay. So much like somebody screaming aliens, I'm just going to scream ball lightning. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, I don't it's know. super rare. That would be disorienting all in itself. Yeah. Wow. I don't know. I'm just I'm just picturing that now. It, and it feels like poltergeist, you know, when the lights are flying through the house. Yeah. Like maybe there was some sort of 
Oh, you know what? This is what it was. It was like a movie, you know, when like the sky cracks open and an apocalyptic event's going down and ghosts are pouring out from the other realm. Mm -hmm. But then the heroes stepped in and stopped it. We just didn't know what went down. Oh. It's like it's like Ghostbusters, except right, none of it was documentary. Uh, yeah. None of it was documented. And it just happened over a lake. And it happened over a lake. <laughs> okay. Moving on to UFOs. The Mutual UFO Network, who we talked about before, M-U-F-O-N, they began investigating the March 8th incident, and while MUFON, I'm going to call them MUFON, I'm not sure if that's what they go by, but M-U-F-O-N, they claim that they can debunk 80 to 90% of UFO cases that are sent to them, they have not found any scientific explanation for this particular occurrence. So that all, is, all that's to say is that we've I, talked about many UFO societies. Yeah. And yes, there can be times where you can go, well, are they biased to confirm this because that's what they do? I like knowing that there is a group that is biased towards not uh, like Scientific. debunking them. Yeah. It reminds me of TAPS. Yeah. The Atlantic Paranormal Society, also a ghost show, ghost hunters. I love that. That's their angle. And that's kind of what we do on ghost hunts is we come right. in with an open mind and we we're going to debunk whatever we can. But every, anything that we can't figure out, mm -hmm. we'll leave it open. And that's kind of what they're doing here. I like that. I mean, I love that that exists, but it also makes me go, oh, okay, well, they can I explain it. I, again, I just, a lot of confirmed things that it's just very hard to explain. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is a tough one. You, I, as soon as you said UFOs or UAPs or whatever we call them now, I went military aircraft. That's what I'm going to lean on. I feel like. I can't lean on that for this. But why not? I just the the movement the movement and, and the longevity of it give it 20 years we'll see something move like this in the sky i'm telling uh, you uh, yeah is it the same thing is this an early like alpha I mean, version could maybe, be a super maybe early not. version i just feel like we would have spotted something like this later, multiple times multiple times yeah that's point. true yeah. i mean this type of movement does seem to be relatively synonymous with some other kind of desert based sightings of ufos but you're right this is pretty extreme movement and widely seen during bouchong's call with officer Velthaus, he said quote planes show as pinpoints on the scope Ooh, maybe this will be kind of further elaborate on your military the, aircraft yes yeah. he also said quote these were the size of half a thumbnail they were from 5 to twelve thousand feet at times moving all over the place three were moving towards chicago i never saw anything like it before not even when I'm doing severe weather. So that kind of backwards addresses, again, the storm cell idea. But that's a really good piece of insight. A thumbnail just being a small image, but in this case, a large blip. That's interesting. That it didn't have a very concise cross-section on the radar. Instead, it had perhaps, I don't know, he doesn't say this himself, so I don't want to add words, but bigger or fuzzier dots on the radar. I mean, yeah, if you look at the pictures on the radar, they kind of look like blobs more than mm -hmm. anything and yeah i mean aircraft would probably be more like a an x right well also these these marks are what he marked and so i don't know if he's oh. marking the size of them as he saw them or if he's just marking them with his own symbols but mm -hmm. just just for what it's worth mm -hmm. but yeah so a lot of this banks on one person to bring that back yeah i mean you're you're kind of right and and if you wanted to be a little bit more cynical that does start to open up the idea of like, okay, well, are we working with the most authentic, straight from the source information, or is there the element of surprise with the person with their own interpretations, what have you? It's, who knows? There's biases and preconceived notions, but coming back though, the FAA has not commented on whether or not what appeared on the radar were planes. That's what's interesting to me. Bouchong reached out to the FAA and he never really heard back from them, least of all publicly. Continuing on though, there are two separate pilots from major airlines who were flying over Lake Michigan that night. They called reporter Michael Walsh to explain to him what they had seen. A bright, cylindrical object crossing their path over Lake Michigan, then disappearing at rapid speeds. The fact that it's cylindrical is very interesting. Yeah. Because on one hand, if it's a straight cylinder, like a can of soda, it is, it's got hard corners, so you're going to have airflow separation, which creates a lot of drag. So this is a, an object I would gather that would be space bound, where there is no drag. It doesn't matter. Right. Unless there are kind of half circle, half sphere ends to it, 
Another piece, and this is just a fun fact from Aero, is that this could be a highly experimental aircraft because cylinders, when rotated, spheres do the same thing like a golf ball. It's how when somebody throws a baseball, you can get the curve on it. You're yep. actually creating lift by spinning it a certain way. Mm -hmm. So cylinders, if they spin fast enough, can create lift and can fly. It's very strange because that's not how we fly, um, but it is something. And so I just wanted to throw that out there to kind of open up the task force mindsets and see what the task force hive mind thinks on that. Is this like maybe a super experimental aircraft, a space bound one or? I mean, true. I mean, who's to say? I would be surprised if the government didn't play around with uh, cylindrical craft. Sure. We have a lot of weird aircraft. I mean, just using wing architecture, you have biplanes, you have the um, like the initial one from the Wright brothers. But you also have flying wings, as they're called, I think, which are like those stealth bombers, mm -hmm. where the whole thing is yeah. essentially an airfoil. Yeah. There's no necessary fuselage of a cylinder with two wings on it. Anyway, I digress. But I like the idea of, of the cylinder because... We've heard that in some very specific stories before, we have. but it's not the quintessential image. The two plates in a teacup. <laughs> <laughs> True, yeah. <laughs> uh, this one's just a can of soda, so let's send in those photos. Both pilots, by the way, that called into Michael Walsh wanted to remain anonymous in Walsh's story because of the stigma surrounding UFO reporting. We've seen that in, in another, I forget what it was called, Christian, but we covered one where there was a sighting on an international flight from France to Japan, carrying wine over Alaska. Oh, yeah. And and remember, there was a lot of other nuance to that. I encourage you, Task Force, to go listen to that episode if you haven't. But there was a lot of stigma around reporting it. And some people were like, is this guy a believer? And he's actually pretending what he sees? Or is he not reporting the truth because of what, like, he could lose his job? Yeah, that was the alien craft with the, mm -hmm. the, the lights. And yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that kind of one like, in front, kind one of one front. trailing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, terrifying. A very interesting story. Yeah, that was the Japan Airlines cargo flight one six two eight. Thank you. That was that episode. Hell yeah. The last theory we're going to talk about is that of water stealers. Very interesting name. Some theorists have believed that aircrafts hover over Lake Michigan to collect water samples from our Earth water. I would imagine that this dovetails nicely with the idea of extraterrestrials. Two campers staying near Lake Michigan, reported to the MUFON that they saw a large amount of water being sucked up into the air by a UFO. The campers say that the tower resembled a waterfall and was backlit by a large object. They were so frightened that they immediately ran inside after witnessing this spout. However, there has been no further investigation into this theory, and there has been no other evidence otherwise to substantiate the idea of these water spouts being extraterrestrial beings gathering samples. But it could be related to the idea of the Michigan Triangle that, once again, we mentioned in the Stephen Kubaki episode. And maybe this is just a hot spot. Maybe they're coming for that good, good, fresh water. I'm just surprised that we didn't have any more eyewitnesses that were closer to the center of this thing. Five hours is a right? long time. Well, you could see it. You can finish dinner. That's true. Like, you can cook, uh, eat, and still watch. Right. And then and still go and, and see what's going on there. So, yeah. like, I, I'm, yeah, I'm a little surprised that we, we don't have more people saying that, like, I don't know. Because, like, kind of, like, corroborating the camper story, right? Mm -hmm. I, too, saw water at, coming out of the lake being sucked up. That you're just surprised nobody else saw that. Yeah, because I mean, five hours is such a long time. I think yeah. that's the thing that like gets me with this. Like, that's such a long time for not enough people to have like the camper like POV and for nothing government wise to happen. Yeah. And you can take that two ways, right? You could take that as as like um, it, it was the government doing it so that's why it's like there's no need this mm -hmm. is just you know everyone that needs to know knows and we're good or we just i mean i don't know it just i would say i don't know because if it is aliens and like why didn't were we out there faster or maybe yeah. we were and yeah and they're not saying anything i think another theory uh. yeah i know i'm totally with you i think another theory i'm just gonna throw out there we are kind of coming to an end here is again reflecting on the idea of these high altitude balloons or whatever's going on right now you know there's been a lot of people saying 
th this is starting to come out now where they're like, yeah, we took down these three or four, but it's been a long, long time, like decades since we've shot anything down. And what seems to be trickling out now is that government bodies are starting to say, actually, we've had countless hundreds of these things over the many years. It's the just, balloons? Yeah, it's just that now suddenly we're aware of them or now suddenly it's catching on. That, again, that is very tenuous information because it is only just now developing. So right. this podcast, by the time it comes out, there will probably be more yeah. of an idea around that. So I wanted to say that, but it does bring to mind the idea that this is nothing other than perhaps an international presence, whether it be planes, technology, advanced or otherwise, that is ours or international. It's, it's a possibility, right? I don't know. I don't know, well, but it makes my mind spin. Well, it does, because also then that means that they are ahead of the U.S. government. True. And interestingly enough, I guess not... That we know, in the public eye for sure, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and for some reason, either isn't sharing if they're a friendly nation, or isn't taking advantage of it if mm -hmm. they are an mm -hmm. enemy nation. So, I don't know. If you had... Kind of weirdly rides the middle. It does. It does. And I think that's what's so compelling about mm -hmm. this particular situation especially since as i mentioned it's one of the most widely witnessed and reported uh, and i'm surprised without the research that we did i i had, i wasn't aware of it as a homegrown corn-fed indiana boy i i hadn't heard of this oh you're like, just a baby i was just a baby <laughs> I was three years old i should have been running up there um but man i don't know this this has my mind racing and i'm gonna leave you usually you throw out the hypotheticals i, I want to leave with a question here and some exploration as we kind of wind down if you were at the head of a nation any nation this is actually very like wakanda-esque and you had technology sufficiently advanced enough to just like outclass anyone in this world would you kind of lay in stealth and gather information to always be aware of what was going on in the world and not use it for ill intent or would you use it to like benefit everybody like what what would your move be just putting ourselves in the mindset that maybe this is a, a earthbound highly advanced technology uh i would what i would do and, and you're talking about just like having technology like advanced technology. right like if you had a craft like this mm -hmm. that could just move 20 miles in a second you could probably survey the entire planet really understand your enemies your allies mm -hmm. whatever would you use that would you act on it would you share it would you stay hidden like, um honestly and especially if, if we're on our own nation probably share it to the highest bidder and, mm. and and in turn like essentially if if we were that ahead i'm a, i would double down and reinvest into it as well mm. right and so stay ahead yeah to stay ahead so essentially they are the these other governments these other countries would be funding my nation to stay ahead got it Interesting. And in so doing, you hope perhaps that you uh, you end up with a global, cohesive humankind. And then we can finally get to the stars. Well, I guess right? everyone's spying on each other like crazy. That's, yeah. That's, that's, that's what's happening. Yeah. Or, but, but like, yeah, in, in doing so, like, you know, they are fund, further funding our advancement mm -hmm. while they are... Good for you. Better for me. ...running older technology. Mm -hmm. That'd be the hope. Man. So interesting. Well, Task Force, let us know what you think. What would you do with your great, great power of advanced technology? And Fredo, before I say what I normally say, two weeks out from today, March 20th, we won't have a proper episode, taking some breaks, taking some time off for the research team. But otherwise, I will see you right back here next Monday for another mystery. <laughs>